How did you kind of stumble into this, the, your research and mm. discovery of these for-profit schools in, in some of the poorest parts of the world? Yeah, and, and I think I can show a few slides to, to illustrate this. Uh, it's great to be here. Sorry about the weather. I think maybe we brought to the weather from England. You know, notoriously, it's always raining there. Um, I, I, it was about, it's in the year 2000. I was a sort of expert on private education. Um, I'd become an expert, a reluctant expert, because as we all know, and the accepted wisdom then was very clear, private education is about the elite. Private education is for the upper middle classes. And I was on a journey in India, in Hyderabad, where I did live for a while, um, on a mission, as they call it, from the International Finance Corporation, the private arm of the World Bank, helping promote elite private education. I was there doing due diligence for the Indian School of Business. And I was, as I say, I was dissatisfied because my work, I felt, shouldn't be about the rich. For whatever reason, I felt I wanted to be focusing on what the poor were doing. But in private education, what to do? So I, on a day off, I went into the, the old city of Hyderabad. I went to the Charminar here, taking a picture, taken at night, where I'd read in my rough guide to India, the slums of the old city were based. And I went with a hunch about what I might find, but was delighted when I did find the down a street corner into an alleyway, I found a low cost private school, a private school in those days charging around a dollar a month. So suddenly the parts of my life seemed to come together, the interest in private education and private schools in the slums serving the poor. I went to this one school, then I found another and another, and I soon connected to about 500 schools which were part of a federation. And I spoke to parents, why were they sending their children to these private schools when they were poor? Clearly they were poor, and yet the, the government schools, the public schools as you call them here, the, the government schools were free. They provided free lunch at, you know, free lunch and free books and everything. And parents told me their children were abandoned in the public schools. So I then went to visit one of these public schools. I'll never forget the sight of those 130 children sitting on the floor in a classroom, eager to learn, learning nothing, and contrasting that with what was going on in the private school. So I came back here to Washington, D.C., really excited, very excited, went to the World Bank, the IFC, telling people the story. People said, no, 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 no. There's nothing much going on here. Calm down, Tooley, calm down. You found maybe a few businessmen ripping off the poor. That didn't seem to fit in what I saw. So I got funding, managed to get grant funding from the John Templeton Foundation, and went on a journey, looking in places like Kibera here, which is not far away from the shopping mall in Nairobi, Kenya, where such terrible things were happening last week. The accepted wisdom says something, a boy like this, um, Frank, where does he go to school? The accepted wisdom say he must go to public school or he's out of school. We followed Frank into the slum, going along the Uganda railway there, into Kibera, and in fact he goes to a low-cost private school, one of about a hundred in the slum of Kibera. Or we went, there's another one, or we went to even in rural China where we were told definitely not by the, the British aid agencies, definitely you won't find any private schools there. We abandoned cars, we traveled on these three-wheelers in remote villages where harvesting was going on, it was September, harvesting was going on, just as you would see it for hundreds and hundreds of years. We asked people and eventually found in the most remote villages, in these foothills of the Himalayas, private schools, low-cost private schools serving these poor communities. In fact, we found 586 of these low-cost private schools in these remote mountains. So this was all really exciting. Then in Ghana, in the fishing villages like this one, Borciano, in just outside of the city, the capital city of Accra. Again, where does Victoria, where does she go to school? She's a daughter of a fisherman. She's the uh, daughter of a fisherman and a fishmonger couple. Where does she go to school? You probably guessed by now. She's in school, yes, but not a public school in a low-cost private school, the Supreme Academy in Borciano, run by this man, Theophilus. Um, we actually, we did a film, I, some of you might have seen it, called The Ultimate Resource, where we had, we went on the fishing boat with the father and 
wonderful going out at three in the morning, coming back with fish that they caught, Joshua his name. We asked him, why does he send his child to a private school? And he told us, well, he tried the government school. It's right next to his house. He tried it. He'd seen the teachers wander in at 11, leave at midday. And he said the reason why the private schools are better than the government schools is because there is a private owner. If you don't teach as expected, you'll be fired and replaced. It was just like a fishing boat as far as he was concerned. People, if they didn't turn up for work, they didn't deserve to work. Totally unlike in the government schools. So this, I think, has been something for me to celebrate. The beautiful tree, as you say, just out in paperback today, is a celebration of these schools. It travels across those countries and others and says, there's something extraordinarily exciting going on here. The poor are not acquiescing, as I said, in the, in the government schools, the public schools, where their children are abandoned. They're now in these private schools, a majority of kids in the, in the poor areas. 70% of the poor kids in urban and peri-urban areas are in these low-cost private schools. We tested, we've tested around 35,000 children now. These low-cost private school children outperform the government school children at a fraction of the cost, and the fees are affordable to parents on poverty line in incomes. So it's a great success story. I'm, I'm thrilled to be sharing this with you today. So, so the book came out. You've been doing your work for a long time. I know that initially aid agencies around the world, and, and I think by a lot of the public, heard what you were saying, and they were uh, skeptical at the very least. Mm. How's it changed? Have you seen changing in attitudes among the public or among aid agencies? Are there people who are now willing to accept that there could be a role for profit or that these schools even exist? Yeah. And are they changing their policies? As we yeah. Say? I mean, it, the first few years of doing this work, they were rather lonely times. Um, in fact, one, uh, one of our critics um, uh, wrote in response to something I'd written, uh, Thule is plowing a lonely furrow. No one is listening to him. Long may it stay that way. Because people at first didn't believe these schools existed. And then when they started to have to see the evidence, when you get photographs and evidence, when they saw these schools really were there, they then started to say, well, there's no significance to these schools. They're businessmen ripping off the poor. They have no significance. But things have changed. And I, in the book, I, you know, I really take the British government aid agency to task, DFID, the Department for International Development. I take them to task and say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very critical about, very rude, in fact, in some places about them. But uh, they've forgiven me for that. And they now, because they went to visit some of these schools, the permanent secretary, the secretary of state for international development, some key people in government went to visit some of these schools, some of the schools I describe in the chapter in Nigeria, for instance. They went to see those schools. And I, you know, I, I, anyone who goes to visit these schools and contrasts them with the public schools and sees what's going on in these schools, anyone will be touched, I think, and moved by the phenomenon and realize that it's something that you want to work alongside rather than against. In the book, you talk about the, the test scores that you've done, the examinations to see the outcomes, yeah. comparing the, the government schools to the private schools. And maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Beyond that, though, I'm interested if there's planning for studies that will follow students as they move along in their career, once they're done with elementary school, to see if there's greater attainment or educational attainment for kids who go to the private schools, maybe even someday workforce outcomes and things yeah. like that. So, so, so we, we, have, we have done a lot of studies. We've, we've published studies from the work we did that's in The Beautiful Tree. We've published them in reputable journals. Um, this was work conducted by myself, Dr. Pauline Dixon from Newcastle, and, and other team members. And the studies have been published, which show, I mean, for economists here, we've used econometric methods to control for background variables and also to control for any possible selectivity bias using the, the Heckman-Lee two-step. It's not a dance, it's an econometric um, method to control for this. Um, and and, and pretty, you know, it's pretty clear that the raw scores show um, private school children outperforming the government. And then when you adapt for all this possible 
better family background and so on in the private schools, still these schools are outperforming the public schools. So that's, that's always the case. And now we've done other studies with the same team, but also David Longfield, who's here now. Um, we're now looking at Sierra Leone, Liberia, South Sudan, going to the world's most difficult places. And we're just analyzing, finally analyzing that data now. We're going to the World Bank after this to report on some of our um, pro provisional results. But again, the same results are coming in. Um, and now we're distinguishing between for-profit and non-profit private schools, because there are both. And it seems there's a mixed picture, but certainly the for-profit schools seem to be standing their own um, against, certainly against the government, they're always better, and often against the non-profits as well. Um, but you're right, we've, for economists, again, this is a cross-sectional analysis. We use as a proxy for prior attainment the children's achievement on an IQ test, a non-verbal reasoning test. So, so that's a proxy for prior attainment, um, but ideally when we do longitudinal studies. The problem with longitudinal studies, we started a couple. Mm -hmm. well, children are very hard to track through, you know, poor children particularly are, often can be quite mobile, whereas the private schools are often all through schools, so you could track the children in the private schools, and we've tracked them quite successfully. In the government schools, typically, the, the, the government schools, the public schools will be um, nursery and then lower primary and then upper primary, separate schools, and no one knows where children are going. There's no tracking of where they're going. So it was impossible to track the children. Um, we'd like to do it. We haven't succeeded in that. Anecdotally, it seems that if there is real human capital development, and our tests are about children's achievement in literacy and numeracy in particular, and if the children in the private schools are doing better than the children in the government schools, then you know, it's, it's almost logically you'd expect them to be doing better in careers and, and, and work um, because those things matter. But we haven't got evidence for that, no.